In this lecture, we will learn about transmission electron microscopy. As the term suggests that we are utilizing transmission mode of electrons to find out the features or see inside the material. So, in this particular case, we want the material to be transparent to electrons, so that uh, uh, electrons can really get transmitted through the material and provide some information about the material itself. And the way the electrons interact with the material is, like if we have a specimen uh, around here, uh, we can get some electrons which are, uh, which are inelastically scattered and we can get them either as uh, secondary electrons, we can also get them as uh, OG electrons. Some things can also get elastically scattered back after inter their interaction with the material and those we can get them as a backscattered electron once we apply a some incident electron beam. So, once we are applying electron beam, I can get some signal which are basically coming back uh, as uh, either as secondary electrons or as OJ electrons or also as backscattered electrons. They can also interact with the material to produce something called X rays. So, we can see that these are all, these are all everything is happening when the electrons can be detected or those signals can be detected back above the sample regime. They are not allowing the electrons to pass through the material, but if we have a material transparent enough, if we can uh, uh, attain a specimen which is thin enough and through which I, we can uh, attain transparency for the electrons to pass through the material, what we can see is we can uh, get the incident electron beam, we can let it pass through, the energy should be high enough so that it comes out as a direct beam or it can also get inelastically scattered. We can also uh, detect the inelastically scattered electrons, but we do not really need them. Why? Because once we are supplying certain kind of energy to the, to the, uh, to the material and if the electron is undergoing some inelastic losses, so we do not know what is the input. Though we know now what the output is, we will not know what the input is, the input energy of the electron. So, we will not know their wavelength, we will not know their overall functionality of how they are interacting with the material, but we are finally getting some signal. In some cases, uh, we can also uh, tap those. Uh, particular signals and we can, it, it might also help in the analysis of the overall material, uh, the overall the structure of the material or to track uh, some sort of a crystallographic directions. But again, uh, we can get much more information from a material if we are, uh, if we are, if the electrons are getting elast elastically scattered. So, if uh, so, if I let my elect incident electron beam to interact with the material and I let it elastically interact with the material and I basically detect what is, the, what are the elastically scattered electrons. So, I now I know what is my input energy, I know how they will interact with the material to give me a final elastic interaction after their interaction with the material elastically. So, I know what is my output, I know what is my input, I can get much more information from the material after this elastic interaction has occurred with the material. So, this electron interactions, they can be very complicated in nature, starting from secondary electrons, backscattered electrons, OJ electrons. They can also indu start inducing some produce the uh, production of some X-rays, and that is actually everything is going back to the uh, above the sample. But if I, there all the signals are not really uh, getting transmitted through the material, but if I let the uh, electron beam be strong enough so that I can get some signals which are letting which are basically being transmitted through the material, I can get them as either direct beam, elastically scattered electron, or also as elastically scattered electron. And mostly, I utilize this uh, as my overall feature of analyzing a particular material, though I can also find some information from the inelastic, inelastically scattered electrons as well. So, this basically comes under the transmission electron, uh, electron microscopy. First of all, what is the difference between my TM and my XRD? TM is a transmission electron uh, microscopy, my XRD is the X-ray diffraction. So, generally, uh, generally we see that for a micron size uh, particle, I always get some diffraction uh, peak. So, in this particular case, I have my 2 theta, in this particular case, I have my intensity. So, for a nano crystalline, for a, uh, for a micro crystalline material, which has grain size greater than 1 micron, I will see some peak, which is associated with a particular 2 theta value. So, I am getting certain intensity of the, from the crystal after, after it has diffracted. So, uh, I can get some, I am getting some information, but as soon as the material starts becoming much more nano crystalline or sub micron uh, size, uh, then what happens? That my XRD is not able to detect whether the, whether I have some crystallinity into, into the material, it, it starts showing broadening of the peak. Because as soon as my, uh, my grains are becoming finer and finer, I start getting refine, uh, broadening of the peak. So, the device error uh, uh, crystallite size can be also calculated from the broadening of the peak itself. 
so but uh, here itself i am not i i don't know whether the broadening is either because i have a amorphous material or the crystals have become nano nano crystalline in nature so that complexity can be easily uh, analyzed by tem and in tem uh, or the transmission electron microscopy we can image and analyze all these nano crystals so what i can get is from electron diffraction is i can get a i can probe a very small area that can be even a nano crystal and i can uh, obtain a electron diffraction pattern because now my beam is much more refined i am letting the electrons interact with the material instead of an x ray then x ray x ray will interact with the cloud of a electron or a, or an atom as a whole but my electrons is so my electron is so sensitive that once i am sending an electron to interact with the material it gets affected even by it gets affected even by a single electron or the positive charge which is there in the nucleus so i can see that i can uh, get a very strong signal if i let my electron interact with the material and now i can point it to a single nano crystal and that's what will give me out its diffraction pattern so in xid uh, overall many many grains contribute to the overall uh, diffraction peak but in my electron diffraction i can let a small beam of electrons to interact with a particular nano grain and i can get a diffraction uh, pattern out of it so that is the advantage of my uh, transmission electron microscopy over the x-ray diffraction so what is so beautiful about this transmission electron microscopy is that elect electron uh, interaction with the material is much more stronger so it is approximately 10 to power 6 to 10 power 7 times stronger than those of x-rays so oh, eventually my diffracted electron will have a very high intensity uh, as uh, one more part we can see out here is the evolved sphere which basically provides me the diffraction pattern the the radius of the evolved sphere is given by 1 by lambda so coming back to it the wavelength in a tem is a, it is approximately 2 picometers whereas an x rays is approximately 1 angstrom or 100 picometers so in this case i have 0 0.02 angstroms and here i have around 1 angstrom so i can see that the wavelength part it is much much higher in x rays but in tem I, my wavelengths are very very smaller so eventually my evolved sphere which is being forming which is being formed so my 1 by lambda is very 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 less so i get a much bigger radius for the evolved sphere so that makes evolved sphere much more flatter so instead of touching uh, touching only few points now once my evolved sphere is becoming much more flatter i can see that more number of points now start interacting with the evolved sphere and they produce a diffraction spot so coming back to it if we can uh, orient a particular crystal uh, for achieving a diffraction pattern i can at obtain all my diffractions within 0 to 1 degree whereas in for x-ray diffraction i have to rotate my crystal from uh, from 0 to 180 degrees to get a particular diffraction because we know that 2d sin theta is equal to n lambda so as soon as i start uh, reducing my lambda i can I, for a particular uh, interplanar spacing obviously my theta is also getting increase with, with increase in the lambda so once i reduce my lambda to very large extent my theta also will get diffracted the diffracted spots will be very very near or they will be within a range of few 0 to 1 degree so that tells me that i can get all my diffraction pattern within a particular tilt of a particular uh, uh, tilt of particular plane which is only 0 to 1 degree along the my beam uh, that much parallel to the beam so if i'm uh, so my beam has to be approximately parallel because it is only 0 to 1 degree so my beam can be much parallel to the uh, particular oriented crystal and still it can produce a diffraction spot it has to be within 0 to 1 degree and that also will give me a particular diffraction pattern and uh, one more thing about it uh, about it here is that since the intensities are very very strong because uh, ex uh, electron will interact very strongly with the particular matter it is 10 to power 6 to 10 to power 7 times stronger. So, what I have to do? Uh, my exposure times automatically reduces to only a few seconds. Whereas, for taking an XRD spectrum, I spend 40 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour, or much more than that to collect the overall spectrum of how my diffraction has really occurred. And also, I limit it to a certain range, maybe say 0 to 180 degree or 20 to 90 degrees. So, I have to limit my diffraction uh, angle to theta value, and then still it takes me a couple of hours. Whereas, uh, diffraction through TM through electrons that is much more rapid. I have to spend only two or three seconds to attain a spectrum. And I, so, since it is very very rapid, 
I can see my electron diffraction pattern, I can directly view it on a fluorescent screen or I can also collect it on a particular detector. So, since my theta values are very, very uh, narrow 0 to 1 degree, I can orient my crystal along the beam direction and just by tilting it marginally, I can also get a electron diffraction pattern. So, that is the beauty of it, I can uh, uh, get a particular image, I can again orient my crystal only within a couple of degrees and I can still get a diffraction pattern. And so, I can get from uh, diffraction pattern from a very small crystals also can be obtained because my beam is uh, very, very sharp, very, very intense. So, I can focus it to a very localized location or very something called nano crystals. I can focus my beam into that those nano crystals and I can still get a diffraction pattern by particularly aligning the beam to a particular diffraction, diffraction aperture. So, I can direct my beam through a diffraction aperture and I can still get a diffraction pattern from very, very fine crystals. As we can, as we know that electron cloud is, uh, is scattered by the positive potential which is there in the electron cloud, whereas x-ray they interact with the whole of electron cloud. So, this is these are the overall differences uh, once we go from x-rays to TEM, that x-rays will interact with the major part of the material, whereas uh, electron beam is much more uh, sharper, much more intense. So, it will it generally provides a very drastic or very, uh, uh, very high intensity information and uh, instead of uh, focusing it to a very large area, I, I can focus it to a very fine area and I can get uh, diffraction pattern even from a very fine grain or which can be a very fine crystal or a nano crystal. I can get my diffraction pattern within few seconds. I can view it on a directly on a screen as well, because it is so rapid and I can also uh, achieve all the diffraction within a tilt of 0 to 1 degree. So, those are the advantages of TM in comparison to that of uh, X-ray diffraction. And moreover, I, as we saw here that the evolved sphere is uh, so, uh, so actually so flat that many of the points uh, they coincide with the evolved sphere, the reciprocal point, reciprocal lattice points they coincide with my evolved sphere to give me a diffraction pattern. And as we see here, the evolved sphere, uh, it comes out to be approximately 1.97 picometer. Once uh, I have my energy of 300 kV uh, electrons, so particularly uh, coming back to the d value, which is approximately 2 to 3 angstrom uh, for, a, for particular crystals. If I put this value in my Bragg's equation, 2 d sin theta is equal to n lambda. So, my lambda is known, now my theta is also, uh, d is also known, because d is approximately 2 to 3 angstroms and I can see that the theta value comes out to be 0.28 degrees only. So, generally as a rule, the scattering angles in the electron diffractions are very, very small, which they vary between 0 and 1 degree. So, I can see that uh, my evolved sphere becomes very, very much flatter, because my lambda value is very, very, uh, very, very less in compared to that of uh, lambda value of a, uh, of an XRD beam. So, in, in my XRD, I use a wavelength of approximately 1 to 2 angstroms or so, uh, which actually narrows down to less than, uh, uh, it becomes around uh, 2 picometer uh, for 300 kV electrons and that basically brings down the scattering angle to around 0.28 degrees. So, eventually my scattering angles are very, very small in transmission electron microscopy. So, there are certain rules. I have my incident electron beam, it interacts with the lattice planes and it gives me a diffracted beam at an angle of 2 theta. And since my theta values are very, very, uh, very, very low, the reflecting planes are almost parallel to the direct beam. So, that is what we can see that my beam which is being getting diffracted, it is tilted only at very fine angles of 0 to 1 degree. So, they are almost parallel to the direct beam. And secondly, the incident electron beam the beam which is basically falling onto the particular uh, to interact with a particular lattice plane becomes the zone axis of the reflecting set of lattice plane, because it is approximately perpendicular to the plane which is basically it is interacting. So, uh, the normal to it will be perpendicular to that and my electron beam is again perpendicular to the normal of the particular plane. So, my incident beam, incident electron beam becomes the zone axis. So, this becomes the zone axis in terms of defining all the other diffraction planes. So, that is the, that those are certain rules which are being uh, followed out here, that my reflecting plane is parallel to the direct beam and secondly, my incident electron beam becomes the zone axis of the reflecting set of lattice planes. So, because there will be so many lattice planes, uh, so those, those become, those bec uh, my, uh, my this incident beam becomes the zone axis for all such planes. This is the overall uh, construct of a particular uh, uh, TEM, transmission electron micros uh, microscope. 
that initially I have a, a source for the electron, source of electron source. Uh, here I generate my all the electrons. Then I have set of magnetic electromagnetic lenses. These are certain con condenser lenses. Generally, three to four uh, condenser lenses are utilized. Then I have my condenser aperture along this particular part. So for, it is required for the alignment part. And then I have my objective aperture, objective conden uh, objective condenser lenses out here. Then I have my objective aperture out here. And this is what decides the overall resolution of my TEM. Then again, I have some uh, ob objective uh, lenses. Then again, I have selected area aperture. And then again, I have some uh, diffraction lenses. I have intermediate lenses. I have projector lenses. And I keep my sample actually in between, which I will come to in, in, in the next slide. But this is the overall construct of a TEM that I have my electron source, a set of electromagnetic lenses first the condenser lenses and then my objective objective lenses and then the projector lenses to finally get a image so i can see out here if my, if i keep my specimen at this particular location i have the i have uh, i have it already passed with the condenser lens so i can see that my my specimen is uh, at particular location and then i have my objective lens which basically uh, gathers uh, information from uh, gathers information from a particular specimen so electron beam comes interacts with the specimen and that information is being collected by the objective lens. Uh, these are not really uh, some um, tangible or something like optical, uh, op they are not like optical lenses, they are more of a electromagnetic lenses. So, there is uh, nothing nothing hard as such uh, as we see in the optical microscopy that we have really glass or lenses which are guiding the light, but in this, in this particular case we have electromagnetic lenses which are directing the electrons. So, once uh, I collect the information, so I can see I have my objective lenses which is gathering the information from the specimen after the electron beam is interacted with the specimen. Then I can see I have an intermediate which is called intermediate diffraction pattern which where what I call back focal plane. Here I form my intermediate diffraction pattern or later on I can also form a intermediate image plane. So, this is a image plane and this is my back focal plane. So, if I keep my aperture at the back focal plane finally, what I get is an image and if I if I keep my aperture at the image plane, finally, what I get is the diffraction pattern. So, I can see that I am forming my intermediate image at the certain location. So, I can have aperture, one thing is called objective aperture or something called back focal plane objective aperture. So, here I am forming my diffraction pattern and I keep if I keep my aperture at, uh, at this particular location, I can get bright field or dark field image or at the second location where I have something called SAED aperture, uh, here I am forming my intermediate image and if I keep my aperture out here, what I get is a diffraction pattern. So, these two are more complementary uh, kind of uh, features which I can really tap and I can I can form an intermediate image as well. So, I can form my intermediate image or intermediate uh, diffraction pattern to finally get a image or a diffraction pattern. My viewing screen can be uh, the fluorescent screen on which electrons can interact and they can come and fall or it can also be a CCD camera. So, I can see that uh, I have a particular specimen, I let the electron beam pass through condenser lenses, when it interacts with the particular material, it passes through and then I have a set of, uh, a set of uh, objective lens, which gathers the information and lets it uh, through a certain apertures. It can be at the back focal plane or it can also be at the image plane and depending on where I choose my aperture, I can get, uh, if I keep my aperture at the back focal plane, I get something which, uh, some, uh, some image. If I keep my aperture at the image uh, image plane, I get a diffraction pattern. And in between, I can have some uh, intermediate uh, lenses for basically magnifying a particular image or a uh, particular image. So, that is what I can see in this particular construct or the ray diagram. So, essentially to construct a uh, construct, uh, TEM, my first uh, requirement is the electron gun, because I need to generate electrons at some point, so that I can let it pass through the Elect, uh, through the specimen. So, I need a some source of electron gun. So, electrons are basically generated out here and they are after that they have to be accelerated. So, that uh, at very high energy, so that they can come and interact with the material. So, uh, I have some sources of uh, electrons those can, that can be either tungsten filament or lab 6 filament or even the field emission gun. So, I can get something called tungsten filament. It can also be lab 6 filament or it can also be field emission gun. 
and depending on uh, that actually tungsten filament is uh, the is a low cost uh, but lower uh, lower emission uh, source lab 6 can improve uh, improve the intensity of the electron similarly field emission gun can also enhance the intensity of electrons to a very drastic uh, very high extent and the beam size also reduces to a very fine so there are certain ways we can utilize all those uh, sources of electrons to generate the electrons so that they can come and react with the particular specimen so once the electrons have been generated I need to get a parallel beam of that, so that I can accelerate them. Uh, so, that they have to be accelerated by a, a node and after that they are basically parallel, they have been, they, they are made parallel, so that they we can get a parallel beam or they have to be uh, made uh, to, to fall on a, a very fine beam. So, there is some set of magnetic lenses and certain apertures, which will allow me to uh, basically condense the beam, make it parallel and then basically I can uh, focus it further for imaging part. So, uh, I can get a parallel beam. So, I can make it like a more like a micro probe. So, I can uh, get a micro probe uh, beam of uh, electrons. Again, I can also allow it to get uh, convergent. So, I can instead of getting a parallel beam, I can make it converge, make get a convergent beam for certain applications. So, for probing I need it like for scanning tunneling electron microscopy I want a nano probe. Whereas, for uh, getting a lattice fringe imaging or uh, getting more diffraction uh, patterns, I can uh, more diffraction uh, intersection of more lower zones uh, at, at particular location, I, I can uh, also utilize my convergent beam electron diffraction. So, uh, so, there are certain ways I can utilize either to achieve a parallel beam or a convergent beam. So, for that I need condenser lenses, which can really direct my electron beam. So, if I can direct my electron beam, if I can control the electron beam, I can get information what I am really looking for. Uh, additionally, I can also uh, tilt my electron beam to get a dark field imaging. So, dark field uh, transmission electron microscope imaging can also be attained once I have control on the condenser lenses, so that I can guide my electron beam. So, that is the importance of the condenser uh, lenses systems, electromagnetic uh, lens systems. And finally, the objective lens is decides the overall resolution of the final image and objective lens is one of the most important lenses because it is generating the first intermediate image and the quality of that will be essential to get the overall resolution. So, once I am able to control the beam that is good enough, but object lens is the one which will collect the information from the specimen and since it is also creating the first intermediate image, this is highly decide, this is high, very critical factor in deciding the overall resolution of the final image. And in between I can have uh, diffraction or intermediate lenses either to get a diffraction mode or an imaging mode, because they are uh, being formed at a different locations. So, I need to have uh, two apertures or lenses, which will guide me in terms of other switching from imaging to diffraction mode or being able to select a particular aperture. And there can be as well uh, some projective lenses, they will magnify the second intermediate image. They can be either image or it can also be the diffraction pattern. And so, projective lenses they help in the magnification of the second intermediate image. Once I have formed my image and I have basically magnified it, I also need to see the image, because I cannot see the electrons. So, I need to see electrons, uh, how, they, the, how they have interacted with the material. So, either I can view them on a fluorescent screen or I can also project it on a some TV camera. I can also record it on either on a negative film or I can also uh, record it on a slow scan CCD camera. So, these are required for the image observations, because we cannot really see the electrons. So, we can we will have to let it interact with the fluorescent screen or see it on a TV camera or I can also get it on a negative film or I can also capture it on a slow scan CCD camera. So, or it can also be on a imaging plate. So, these are certain uh, ways we, we, through which I can observe my particular image and all these things are uh, all, all the t setup of TM involves uh, interaction of electrons with the matter that. So, the traveling of electron to, uh, electron is highly necessary and that can happen, because I am also looking for uh, achieving a information, which is elastically, which is uh, elastically scattered electron. So, I need to avoid any interaction of electron with the atmosphere. So, for that I definitely need something called a vacuum system, because I want to, I want the electrons to pass through the beam, uh, through the particular, uh, particular uh, channel without interacting with anything else, any, any of the atmosphere. If it interacts with the inter atmosphere, it is basically losing its energy. So, that will become inelastic interaction. So, uh, to allow uh, to disallow any interaction of the matter or with the gas, 
so they so the gas particle should be absent in the column so for that i definitely need a vacuum system and here i require a very high vacuum which is approximately 10 to power 6 to 10 to power 7 uh, minus 6 to 10 power minus 7 uh, tor so that part uh, that much uh, that much uh, vacuum i requ require uh, 10 to power 6 to 10 power 7 uh, minus 7 tor i require for uh, for the creating the vacuum so there is this is a very high vacuum which is being being utilized out here so for this i am requ i require very high vacuum which is approximately 10 to power minus 6 to 10 to power minus tor so that electrons can continue without any interaction with the nearby gases so i can get an information which is truly from the interaction with the specimen and uh, i can achieve my vacuum by uh, utilizing a, a pre rotary pump which is some sort of a pre vacuum pump and later on I can go for a diffusion pump or a iron gator pump to create such high vacuum. So, that is what is highly required for a PM imaging. So, here we see that uh, we require a projective lenses for magnifying the second intermediate uh, image and then for visualizing the image I need to have some sort of a TV camera or a CCD camera or I can also record it on an imaging plate or I can also have it look it on a negative film. And uh, since everything is happening uh, with the electrons, the electrons need not get interacted with the nearby gases. Uh, so I need to allow a vacuum uh, to be there, so uh, so that the, so I get the information only from, which is truly from the material. So vacuum uh, to the order of 10 power minus 6 to 10 power minus 7 tor is required, and which I can attain uh, either by utilizing a, a pre vacuum rotary pump or followed it uh, backing it up with diffusion pump or a iron gutter pump, which become the main uh, source for creating the vacuum. So coming back to the picture skew view of the electron gun. I have uh, my filament. This can be either tungsten filament or a lab six filament. So I, this is this becomes my source of electrons. I apply certain bias to it. I apply certain uh, bias to it, and I generate electrons. Once electrons are being generated, my Wiener cylinder. It is it has a negative potential. So once the electrons are being generated, it is now util, uh, it is now basically focusing the electrons to some particular uh, spot. So, that is what is being given done by the negative uh, potential out here that I am generating my electrons, electrons are negatively charged particles and they are they now get focused or they get repelled by the negative bias and from here they are now accelerated because uh, as, as I note I apply some certain potential uh, positive potential. So, now I help the electrons to accelerate to finally get a electron beam. So, in this particular case I can utilize tungsten or lab 6 filament or even field emission gun as my electron source. I apply certain negative bias to basically construct my electron beam. Later on I can create some positive potential, so that electrons can get attracted and they can get accelerated to finally I can get my electron beam. And the sample preparation uh, it, it is very, very highly critical, because I need to make my sample uh, truly transparent to electrons. And this is how uh, overall construct of uh, uh, T m looks like. I have my electron gun to supply me electrons. Then I have set of condenser uh, apertures and condenser lenses, which basically focus the beam or control the beam. Uh, I can get either parallel or a convergent beam. Then here is my specimen port, where I keep my specimen. Then I have certain objective aperture, which collect the light from the, uh, from the specimen. I have objective lenses. I again have some diffraction lenses or intermediate lenses. And again some projector lenses to finally be able to observe it on a fluorescent screen or a image recording system. So, that is the overall construct of my transmission, transmission electron microscope. But again here the very much uh, requirement is of the sample to be transparent to the electrons. So, generally we have some sort of holders, which can either provide me a tilt in case when I require it, it can be up down tilt, it can be a side tilt or it can also be a rotation, which can which, which I can get from the holder itself. So, this is what uh, it is uh, out here that I keep my sample on a particular copper grid and it has some locking ring on which I keep my sample which is approximately 3 millimeter in diameter. So, I can keep my power, I can make a very thin film which is approximately 3 millimeter in diameter, but which is a which the center part of that is transparent to electrons. I can also have some powders which are very fine enough and those are those are basically transparent to electrons. But to prepare a sample it is very very critical to attain a uh, to attain uh, uh, transparent transparency to, ele to electrons. What I can do? Since my uh, samples will be mostly bulk in nature. So, even to select a particular piece of sample from a from a from a bulk is very 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 challenging. Because first of all my sample has to be representative of the overall 
bulk structure what I have really intend to look at. In say for an example, I am extruding a particular rod. So, the structure at the surface will undergo much more shear. So, the grain refinement will might occur much more at the at the surface, whereas the grains may remain unaltered at the core. So, if I am taking my sample only from the surface and I say it to be representative of what is happening in the core of that particular rod, I am totally wrong. So, I need to carefully select my sample as such and then be able to relate it to the particular surface or particular area where I have taken my sample from. So, I might require sample either from the surface as well as from the core to be able to say what is happening at the surface and what is happening inside the core of that particular rod. So, once I want my, my, my sample to be representative of the, of the particular bulk material, so I will take so many samples like from the surface as well as from the core, because what I am seeing in team is only a very refined or very, very small regime of the overall bulk. So, I need to very carefully select the region or the sample which is representative truly, truly representative of my overall bulk material. So, in order to make a, if my, to, in order to make my material uh, very, very fine or transparent to electrons, initially my samples may not be transparent to electrons. So, what I will do, I will first, first of all, I will section my material into very fine slices, uh, which, are, which might be approximately a, mill, a millimeter or less than that, maybe a couple of micro, microns, as fine as I can cut them through a saw. Then I will start thinning my sample from say less than, uh, from more than which is greater than micron, maybe say uh, approximately 100 micrometer in thickness, I start thinning it down to less than 1 micrometer. So, once I have a particular disk, a particular sample which is less than 1 micro, micrometer, I will punch out a small regime, which is approximately 3 millimeter in diameter and its thickness will be less than 1 micrometer. So, I will attain a disk, which is approximately 1 micron and then less than 1 micro, 1 micrometer uh, thin. Once I have this particular disk, I start thinning it mechanically. So, I start thinning it down mechanically and I can, I can keep mechanically uh, thin, thinning it till it has reached much lesser than approximately 200 nanometers or even as fine as, as, as I can go. So, what I will have is a thin disk, which is approximately 100 to 200 nanometer in thickness. Uh, if the sample is conducting, I can apply some corrosive or some uh, some media which can start eating away my this particular material. So, what I can get is I can start throwing some media, it, this is an enlarged view, I can start throwing in some media from both the sides until it starts eating away the material and creates a very fine hole in the center of the disc. So, what I eventually get is, what I eventually get is more like this, I get a material which is a very fine hole in the center. So, this hole, this particular point is nothing but a hole and the uh, just the area nearby this particular hole is now transparent to electrons. So, ideally if I see it, it will be more like this, it will be transparent to electrons. So, this is what I am really targeting at to get a material which is transparent to electrons or I can also utilize something called ion beam milling. This is uh, for conductive samples, I can use uh, something called jet, uh, jet, the twin jet polishing. I am sending two jets on each one on each side to start eating away the material and make it transparent to electrons at the, the center. Once the once I create a hole, the center, the part near the hole is transparent to electrons. So, seeing it from the top view, I can also, uh, this particular thing will look more like this, that I have a disk, which is a hole in the center. So, that particular hole, uh, just the area nearby that particular hole is now transparent to electrons. Uh, so, that I can create by twin jet polishing or alternately, I can also supply some ion beam. I will take an, a source of argon, I can start throwing uh, my, uh, my ions on the sample and I start rotating my sample. So, I can create a similar way, I can create a hole in the center and on the region near this particular hole is again transparent to electrons. So, I can look around in this particular regime to learn more about the sample itself. So, there are certain of certain ways. Uh, so, my overall disk diameter remains around 3, 3 millimeter, but the central part is now it has a certain hole in it and the area nearby that particular hole is now transparent to electrons and I utilize that particular area to be observed or uh, to be analyzed under transmission electron microscope. So, I can see how uh, critical uh, particular sample preparation is and I need to make the sample uh, big enough so that I can handle it. At the same time, 
some part of it or the center part of it has to be transparent to electrons. So, I can see or visualize or observe or analyze the region in that particular regime. So, that is what is the overall thing about uh, the sample uh, preparation in the transmission electron microscope. And once my sample is ready, I insert it uh, in the particular TEM holder or the transmission electron microscope holder. So, I can observe it further. And uh, how the uh, overall uh, magnetic lens looks like is, uh, I have a magnetic lens which consists of a copper wire and with some iron pole pieces. So, what I am seeing is uh, uh, copper wires which are uh, out the out these and these are nothing but the pole pieces of iron. And once I supply some uh, electric uh, current to it, it will start creating a magnetic field. So, I will get, so get some magnetic field which are uh, represented by this uh, red lines. And uh, so, what I can do? Uh, I can get a rotationally symmetric magnetic field, but this is again inhomogeneous, because I will get a weak field in the center and very strong field in the on the sides near the pole pieces. So, what I can see is if my electron is passing through it, electron will get uh, electron will basically get strongly deflected once it once it undergoes a very high field. So, once the electron is traversing along this uh, near the pole piece, it will get deflected very uh, to very sharp uh, very sharply, whereas an electron getting passing in the center will be deflected to a very la lesser extent. So, I can see that they will undergo a kind of a crossover. So, they may not get focused at the same point. So, that that actually results the result that the electrons which are close to the center, they are less strongly deflected than those passing uh, the lens from the far from the axis. So, far from axis they get uh, diffracted very quickly, whereas in the center they, they keep going to much farther extent and they get deflected to a very small extent. So, instead of getting a parallel beam, uh, so we can uh, try to focus all this all this beam as a into a spot and this spot now becomes the it is called so called crossover, because I have a particular regime, uh, instead of a spot it is more like a regime on which my electrons are basically being targeted or being focused at. So, I get instead of getting a fine very fine spot, I get a kind of a spot uh, or a region which is called a crossover. And that happens because I have my electromagnetic lenses and they, they create a stronger field near the pole piece and the weak field is much weaker at the center part. So, electrons which are traveling at the center, they get deflected to a smaller extent as compared to the near the pole pieces. So, I can get some instead of getting a very fine or a single spot, I get some sort of a regime and that is called a crossover of the electron beam. And since it is a magnetic field which is being applied, so my elect, so the electrons will experience a Lorentzian force. And since Lorentzian force is a component of the electric field as well as the magnetic field and uh, it also depends on the charge by velocity ratio of the electrons. So, basically this particular part is more like this that I am applying, uh, I am letting the electrons get accelerate, I am applying a electric field, I am applying a magnetic field. So, ideally with the magnetic field which is co being controlled by co coil current, it results in some sort of force which is perpendicular both to velocity part as well as the magnetic part. So, what happens that basically? Uh, that basically is trying to pull the electron at the same time it is trying to push the electron to certain direction. So, that creates a helical trajectory, because my electron is traveling like this and I am at the same time I am trying to pull it or I am also trying to push it depending on the kind of field I apply. So, my uh, so my magnetic lenses they are uh, they are uh, resulting some forces which are perpendicular to V. So, I have some forces which are perpendicular to V as well as my B. So, I can get a more like a helical trajectory. So, electrons will traverse more like in helicity uh, once they are traver traversing in a magnetic field. So, so I can see that the magnetic rotation is caused uh, with respect to the object. So, that basically is very essential because depending on the kind of magnetic field I am applying, it will tend to rotate my image. Because electrons the way they are flowing, if they are very stronger field, they might to uh, they might uh, get uh, uh, deflected to a larger extent. I am applying a very smaller electric uh, magnetic field, they might deflect, get deflected to a lesser extent and that is nothing but my magnification, because I am applying field very strongly, I am allowing to form a very bigger image. So, my image can also get rotated once I am applying a certain field. So, this is very one of the very important points in T m that electrons are traversing a helical trajectory. That depends on the magnetic field which is being applied, because that magnetic field is strongly uh, creates a force which is perpendicular to both 
the velocity and the uh, the b part of it or the magnetic field part of it. So, that eventually forms a helical trajectory and then it creates a some sort of a rotation of the object itself. So, the features of T m and they basically involve like this that uh, my electrons are interacting with the material either inelastically or elastically, um, but I want to avoid the uh, inelastic uh, scattering, because it is not containing an information. It is similar to like uh, leading to absorption, because I have I am applying a certain electron beam, I know its energy, I know what are its features and if it starts getting uh, scattered inelastically, I do not know how what kind of losses it has gone through once it has interacted inelastically. And after its diffraction with the material, I get some. I am getting some information, but I don't know how it is being generated. What was the incident energy of the electrons? So I always need to avoid what is happening inelastically because it is. It won't contain any local information. But if I am letting it el el elastically interact, or el elastic diffraction can occur, then basically I can also uh, modulate its either amplitude or its phase with the primary beam. So, I can get both the information from either defects or the lattices. Uh, from that, I can uh, get what is the kind of amplitude change or what is the kind of a phase change with respect to the primary beam, primary beam. And so, I can get information, I can extract the information from the diffracted beams, what is happening locally. There is the advantage of my elastic scattering with the material. I can avoid, uh, so I tend to, I need to avoid the inelastic, inelastic scattering part of it. And again, the energy which is basically uh, what I am utilizing in the T m is approximately 100 to 400 kV to result me a uh, uh, evolved sphere which has a, uh, an inverse radius of 2 picometers. Uh, and these rays uh, we can go uh, energy as high as 1.5 mega E v. So, that in that particular cases I can have sample which is even more than a micrometer in thickness. So, that part basically decides the overall energy uh, which can uh, pass through the material. So, conventionally or uh, these days we generally utilize uh, uh, energy which is approximately 100 to 400 kV and that is uh, enough uh, for uh, getting a giving us a good information, but instruments as uh, as high as 1.5 MeV, MeV are available which can penetrate down to uh, penetrate, uh, penetrate uh, into a material which is approximately more than 1 micrometer in thickness, but generally the thickness of specimen has to be approximately 10 nanometer or maybe the small, the lesser the better. And again my resolution part depends on the thickness and again uh, if you want to get a high resolution team imaging uh, that basically for that particularly we need to have a th uh, the specimen to be thin enough approximately nanometer uh, in thickness. So, I can extract much more information uh, in terms of its lattice fringes or high resolution grain boundary imaging and so on. So, overall features uh, of TM are that I need to get uh, uh, I need to avoid the inelastic scattering. I need to get the elastic, elastic scattering and from that I can get extract the information either for the lattices or for the defects and then I can measure either the amplitude or the phase and I can tell what is happening locally in the particular material. The overall energy uh, what what I uh, the electron beam energy what what is being interacted with the material that generally is approximately 400 to 400 uh, kV uh, and for that we need to have a specimen thin uh, approximately 10 nanometer. And then uh, these days some other instruments are also available, which can increase the energy to 1.5 MeV. And for that my sample size can be as thick as 1 micron. And for high resolution imaging, I definitely need to have a material, which is thin enough, less than couple of nanometers. So, coming back to the ray diagram, I can see that my specimen uh, lies here. And then I have my back focal, uh, back focal plane. Then I have my intermediate image, image which, is, which is forming. Then I have some intermediate lenses. And then finally, I get my image on the either as an image or as a diffraction pattern. I can uh, I have a, I can have a screen. So so that is what is required out here. That I can selectively take a particular beam in back focal plane. I can allow only either on, on, only the transmitted beam to pass through, or I can also also allow only the diffracted beam to pass through. So if I am, if I am allowing only my transmitted beam to pass through, what I get is something called bright field image bright field image or if I let only one of the diffracted beams to pass through, diffracted beam to pass through what I get is something called dark field image. So, if I choose a particular aperture, uh, back focal plane aperture through which I am letting only my transmitted beam to pass through, I get something called bright field image. If I let only one of the 
diffracted beams to pass through, what I get is a dark field image. And conversely, I can look at a certain particular area, if I, if I have particular microstructure in the, in the bright field imaging, uh, say I had a particular kind of a particular image, uh, which is being formed in the bright field image. And if I want to, I want to see what, say this, this can be very different phases, this can be phase A, this can be phase B. And to confirm that, we, I need to get a diffraction pattern, because diffraction pattern is arriving from the elastic, uh, uh, elastic interaction of the beam with the material. So, if I want to see oh, what is this particular phase, say I want to see what this particular phase is. So, I can let my beam concentrate on this particular part and it can give me a diffraction pattern. So, I can get a particular diffraction pattern that will be consistent to the kind of orientation. So, I can again tilt my uh, particular uh, sample to get a different orientation, because within a tilt of few degrees, I can get diffraction patterns from any different planes. So, I can get diffraction pattern depending on the orientation of this particular crystal. So, if I can align my beam according to this particular phase, I can get some diffraction pattern. So, I can I can do that uh, that part as well or I can go back to it more like this, that I can select one of the diffracting, diffracting spots. If I take an area and as I can take a bigger area instead of a small focused uh, regime, uh, I can have an aperture which can accommodate more number of uh, more number of uh, grains out there. If I choose say, this much area, which has more number of grains and I am getting some diffracting spots, uh, alternately I can choose a particular diffracted spot. I put my aperture here and then I can again come back and see that this diffraction spot is resulting because of which particular grain. So, which all those particular grains which are contributing to, to diffraction spot will start appearing brighter and this thing is called dark field image, because I am letting only one of the diffraction spots to pass through and only certain areas which are contributing to my this, this of my diffraction spot, because they are oriented favorably, they will start appearing bright and rest of the field will be nothing but. So, I have a dark field, but my features are bright, which are resulting this particular diffraction spot and this thing is called dark field imaging. So, that part I can achieve with the transmission electron microscope. I can either get an image or I can also get a information about a particular crystal through its diffraction. So, that is the overall capability of my transmission electron microscope. So, eventually, eventually what we can see, uh, I have uh, my back focal plane, this gives me uh, diffraction pattern out here and if I keep my aperture somewhere, I can get either a bright field image, if I let my transmitted beam pass through or if I let my diffracted beam pass through, I can get some image and that will be the dark field image or if I can put my aperture at this particular location, which is uh, nothing but a Gaussian image plane and that will eventually form a diffraction pattern. So, I can see that in, uh, in transmission electron microscopy, I am capturing the beam, which is passing through the material. So, my particular specimen or the sample is to be transparent to electrons. So, if I am using something which is uh, much thicker, through which electrons cannot pass through, I will not get any information. So, the information like secondary electrons, backside electrons, they have to be collected back, like not through the material, but back on the surface of the particular material or the sample, but in transmission electron microscopy, I make the sample thin enough. So, my electrons can pass through and they can interact with the material elastically and then I get the information. So, for the diffraction, the planes have to be almost parallel to the incident beam and then they get diffracted within a regime of 0 to 1 degree. So, I can see that uh, for, uh, for a particular plane to be aligned, I have to tilt it to a very marginal, uh, mar marginal extent, so that I can align, al align it and I can get a diffraction uh, pattern from that particular uh, particular uh, plane. And again, the zone axis becomes the incident beam itself, that the direction of incident beam becomes the zone axis of the planes, which are diffracting my, diff which are getting, which are basically diffracting the electron beam. So, I can see that the zone axis of that, is the incident beam itself, itself becomes the zone axis. And then again, uh, the sample preparation is very, very critical because uh, for electrons to pass through, uh, they need to be, uh, they need to uh, basically interact with the material and the sample itself should be thin that the energy which is being supplied to the electron is enough uh, for it to come out of the material. So, that is, so that is the requirement for that. And again, my evolved swell becomes so huge in comparison to the that of uh, which is constructed in the x-ray diffraction. 
that now my evolved square can touch more number of points in the reciprocal lattice spacing. So, more number of uh, planes uh, basically produce a diffraction pattern and now I can analyze the diffraction pattern to come out with what is the overall material or what how what how the basically uh, what all uh, uh, how what is the overall phase which is present out there in my particular material. At the same time I can get the uh, get an image, I can see the crystalline nature of the material. I can also focus a nano crystalline grain itself and I can get some information out of it or I can do a vice versa that from a polar diffraction pattern I can look which all grains are oriented favorably to my incident beam. So, I can see this kind of things in the transmission electron microscope and there is much more to be explore, explored which I will basically cover in part 2 and I end my this particular lecture here. Thanks a lot.